Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege that we have to, to gather and, uh, and that we can come to you. We ask that your spirit would just make your word come alive, Lord, for our spirit, that our spirits would get fed this morning in this place. We would be strengthened in our inner man, Lord, and we would, we would indeed be those people like Jesus would cry out about that have ears that would hear what your Holy Spirit wants to speak, Lord. We, we want to be the people that hear what your Spirit says to us today. And so, Lord, we just ask you help any distraction, anything that would take our mind off of you, Lord, but rather just let everything bring us into a clear focus upon the things that you have to prepare us for this upcoming week. We ask that now in the name of your Son, Jesus. Do your work in our lives. And all God's people who agreed with me said... Amen. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 as we continue learning about uh, what God has for us in, the, in, in this passage of Scripture, beautiful passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 14. We were learning how that there were some, some things that Paul said that the church, each one of them had differing gifts and that they were allowed to use those gifts. Paul, last week I, I mentioned that he compared the gifts, the gift of tongues to the gift of prophecy. And which one did he say was the greater of the gifts? Tongues, speaking in another language or speaking um, words from the Lord? Which one is, is the, considered the greater gift? Prophecy. The greatest gift given in the scripture is that gift where the person, the, in both cases, oftentimes the people that are, are using those two gifts don't actually know um, it's not them that come up with the with the message. It's a it's a God breathed God spirit breathed message that comes from God's throne. Whether you're speaking a tongue of praise to the Lord in a different language, and and declaring the mighty deeds of God in some foreign language, that's great. But even Paul says that um, if you have a gathering together as a church, now I I mentioned last week when you come together as a church, he said make sure that you do it in an orderly manner. You know, if somebody has a tongue, let them declare that praise to God in whatever language they do. But he said, one or two in order, you know, and only, he said, if there was someone who could do what? Interpret. interpret. If you have someone that gives that has a gift of interpretation to the, to, to the tongues being given, then it's a really edifying thing. You know, it's beautiful. So one person, maybe they're praising God in, a, in another language. Maybe it's French, and you don't know French, but uh, someone else does, and they interpret that tongue and, and explain that, you know, they just declared how great and magnificent the Lord is and, and how wonderful His forgiveness is or whatever they, the, 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 the praise given to God as they're speaking in tongues. Wonderful. It can edify the whole church as long as we understand what they say. If, if you don't understand the language, you're just sitting there going, I don't get it. You know, it, it doesn't mean anything. It's just, it, he says, so, so there's a couple guidelines that he gives to the church, or I said some rules for engagement, you know, that last week we would go over this week, is that Paul said when it comes to the speaking in tongues, he says, make sure that you, that you use this gift in an orderly manner. God is, he said, not a God of confusion. Let each one, in verse 27... If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two, or at most three, and each in turn, and one to interpret. So do it orderly. You know, just let the one person give the praise and another person interpret. Everyone can hear what, it's, what it is that's going on. And maybe you might be the one that knows that language, and you'll be edified hearing that praise. I know when I heard my first tongue, I told you about it, it was that gal speaking in northern Arizona in perfect Florence. We, we say what is called true Italian, verità italiano. It's a perfect Italian. It's what they use in 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 Florentine, Florence, uh, Italy. It's it's real eloquent. I grew up speaking Sicilian. That's like slang of Italian. Pigeon, yeah, that's the pigeon of Italian. Okay, for for a Hawaiian equivalent, it's not really considered, you know, so polished. And so she, she gave this beautiful, eloquent praise of God, how magnificent the Lord was, how wonderful. And it was, 
I, I was edified. I thought, you know, that's that's wonderful. But I didn't realize most of the people in the room don't speak Italian, so they're all going, huh? <laughs> and if you speak another language, anyone here speak another language? Have you ever walked up to someone and spoken in your native tongue and then they look at you like, you know, the deer in headlight look? And you know right away, they don't know my language, you know, they, they just don't get it. Well, that's why they were marveling. We, we looked at in the book of Acts in chapter 2 that they marveled when the disciples were sitting there speaking, each one of them in their own native tongue, the praises of God, declaring the wonders of God. And, and you know, I hate that they would even say this, that some of, the, some of them the, that didn't believe in God were mocking, saying, oh, they're just drunk with wine. I have never heard of drunk people speaking f perfect French or... Italian or Latin or Greek or, you know, it, come on, Egyptian. No, they, they don't do that. So Peter st stood up and said, for, he goes, M listen, men of Jerusalem, he said, these men are not drunk with wine. They are filled with the Holy Ghost. The promise what God gave was that he'd give, the, give his spirit so that we could be a witness, a witness for his power for his kindness, what he has done. And you guys are, are seeing the fulfillment, what was prophesied about. Now, I know that some churches today teach that those things were alive back then, and they say they're not alive today. They, you know, it's for only for back then. Tongues, um, prophecy, all those wonderful things. They were, they were and they, they pluck a part of a verse out, which is very poor, uh, homiletics is cool. It's completely out of context. They say when the perfect comes, the imperfect will be done away with. And so they they say that the the passing of the gifts has taken place because the perfect has come. Jesus being the one, the perfect one, that has come. So we don't need the, 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 the imperfect, the small things to tell us about him anymore. That's baloney. The verse came after Christ had already come, so... It's referring to his second coming when he comes again. After he comes again, guys, and we're caught up to be with the Lord, will we need to speak in tongues or the, will we need interpretation in tongues? When we're standing before the Lord, I don't think so. I think we'll, we'll know all the languages. You know, I, has anyone ever pondered what language are we going to speak when we get up there? Will we, you know, like the Bible says there's tongues of men and there's tongues of angels. Will we, will we all of a sudden be speaking angelic language? You know, or will he be speaking, for me, you know, I'll see my father will speak in Sicilian. What, what, will, what will he speak? What did Jesus speak when he was on earth? This is always a good brain teaser. Anyone know what language he spoke? Hebrew. Hebrew. Aramaic, right? They had, they actually, it, this is something that's different from the Middle East than American culture. They actually speak multiple languages quite commonly. You know, to speak um, Hebrew, to speak Greek, Aramaic, is very common in that part of the world that you that you are at least maybe Latin because the Roman influence had come into Jerusalem at that time. The Herod had had taken over. They had guys that spoke all these languages. Not uncommon. And for those of you who have traveled overseas and you, you meet the stewardess or steward on the plane, and and I always have fun. I always speak to them in, in a different language just for fun when I'm when I'm traveling and. It's funny because the you know when you're on international flights they'll actually find a flight attendant that speaks your tongue, and they'll say uh, I'm sorry uh, you know they'll apologize I'll get someone for you, and they'll go get me someone who speaks in Italian or, or or you know I just have I just switched to the other one just for fun to see what the the steward or stewardess will do and amazingly a lot of them they just switch on a dime to another language, it's just like the, and then you find out how, how many languages do you speak oh four fluently and. Maybe five or six more, you know, conversationally. Just enough to get by. I'm like, wow, so different, you know. Now, if we were in church and we had those people from all over the world, this is what was going on in their day in Pentecost. They were traveled from all over the world. And they had people from, all, you know, different, different languages spoken. And they didn't have that new gizmo that I just saw on television last night. There was on the... You know, scientific show. I always, I'm weird. I like those science channel things. And the, the invention show showed this guy had made a, an app on the phone where you could speak. And uh, when you speak, it translates. But they've upgraded it. It has an earpiece now that you put in. It looks really fu sci-fi, futuristic, you know. And you can pop it in. And it, um, 
when, when you get to, to the person, maybe they speak French, you speak English, you push your, your little translate buttons on your phone, and then you speak to them a, in English, and they hear it in their earbud in French, translated. Instant now. And they can actually carry on conversation. And it's starting to sweep the business. It was on the, the, the thing shows, you know, on the Science Channel they show. And sweeping the new things in the business world is, is these little gizmos, you know, the, the little cute little, you know, earbuds. And it comes now with a second one that you can pair them and you can listen to your music when you're not using it for translation. Woohoo! High-tech, expensive headphones. But they can translate on, uh, on demand. I mean, I always felt privileged that I spoke multiple languages. Sometimes I got to interpret. But these guys got a little earbud that'll do it for you now. Don't need the Holy Spirit anymore, right? <laughs> Wrong. How many of you need the Holy Spirit to have somebody speak a word of prophecy to you? You know, when, when, pro when the prophet speaks, he doesn't say what he thinks. He says, thus saith who? The Lord. Now, last week I used the analogy of a prophet being a radio. A radio that only has w been tuned to one frequency. And that's the, the, the part on the dial, the frequency that God himself broadcasts his signal on. So a true prophet is tuned in to the Lord, and he only speaks when what's going on. When the, when the, when the Father is broadcasting the signal by his via his Holy Spirit. Now somebody say, well, this stuff's all invisible. I can't see it. I don't, even my own daughter, Raquel, says, ha. How do we know if God, you know, this is a legit question, 14-year-old. You know, can't see God. How do we know he's really there? I said, honey, there's a lot of things you can't see that, that, how about air? Anybody see, well, uh, that's not really a fair question in Hawaii. Oxygen. <laughs> Let's use that. We can see our air sometimes because of the volcano. <laughs> the fog, it's pretty gross. But um, oxygen, anyone seen oxygen or a hydrogen molecule? I mean, really, they say there's two of them and one of the other, and they combine and they make this stuff called water. We got a whole bunch of that behind me. But anyone actually seen the, the actual gas? I mean, when I was in school, we learned an experiment how to separate the two gases into two different chambers by putting two rods in the water, putting a current through it, separating one with a positive side, one with a negative, and one, one of the atoms is positively charged and it goes to the, attracted to the other side, and, the other, and you separate them into two columns, and... You, you want to get, the, does anyone know why they call it H2O? Because you get two parts more of one of the gases to one part of the other. Literally, when it separates, one of the columns fills up with double the amount of the other in the little tubes as you, as you do. Now, I'm a science geek for sure. I can tell by the looks I'm getting because I actually know this stuff. And I was goofy enough to actually say, I don't want to just know about it. I asked my science teacher, can we do it? And then when we're done, can we light it? As a pyro, too, I admit it. But, uh, you know, I wanted to see what, what happens when you separate this water into its elemental gas parts. But even when we did it, I didn't actually know, like, I couldn't see other than that the column of the, we had these glass tubes that we used, and we had them full of water, and, and we had it so that the, gas as it separated and went to the different electrodes filled up in its respective tube. And that's how we found out, you know, how many liters of, of oxygen to how many liters of hydrogen we got. And I'm like all geeked out. I like, I'm like, this is really cool. Now what can we do with this stuff? And he goes, well, my science teacher also was my scout master at that time. He was a pyro too. He goes, oh, this stuff burns really good. And when you, and when you light the hydrogen side, do you know how fast hydrogen burns? I mean, I don't know if I should, over 5,000 feet per second, if you make a one-inch tube of it and fill it with hydrogen and you light it, it will go over all, a mile in length. Just, I'm sorry, it's 5,236, so it's right around a mile in one second. You light the one end and the flash will go through the tube all the way about a mile in distance, just like that. Well, my pyro teacher's like, watch this. Puts a little flame by the thing and goes, pop! Like, I mean, uh, I can't do it. I don't want to get in trouble with the sound system. But it'll really, really loud bang all at once. Real hard pop. 
<laughs> like, do it again, do it again. Let's let's run this electrode some more and make some more. You know, we need to just blow up stuff. This is fun. I mean, I was just having fun, and it, it, it is interesting. But I don't, I can't. If if you say to me, how do you know there's those things in ox in water, those gases? You can't really see them. And I have to answer you. You're right. I have to take it by faith. I mean, at some point, you know, you study it all you want, but it's an invisible stuff. Yet I breathe it all the time. I need it to stay alive. How about gravity? Anyone seen gravity lately? I haven't seen it. It's supposed to pull you down at 9.8 meters per second squared. You know, it's, a, it's got power. It's invisible, though. So is God's Holy Spirit. Anyone seen a radio wave lately? Do you know they're all around us right now? There's, there's all sorts of radio waves broadcasting right now around us. You just need the right instrument to tune in. So there are a lot of things that are invisible. If someone ever says to you, well, I can't believe in an invisible God, I say, well, you have trouble with air? You have trouble with gravity? I mean, it's funny how they have no trouble with some of the things what we have around us in the natural world, and yet they, they struggle. Do you have trouble with radio waves? Seen a radio wave. I always like to point these things out because these things are real. They exist around us all the time and so does God and so does His Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit of God is broadcasting His signal and there are certain, they're like units, radio units I'll call them. There's certain called prophets that are tuned in. And though everyone else around might not perceive that that frequency is being broadcast they're tuned into it and so as soon as the frequency comes to them what do they do it's like the it's like the radio that receives the the radio waves it, it encodes it puts it through its little transistor out its little speaker and out comes the message this is the broadcasting system of whatever station well this is god's broadcasting system he says and the prophet is the guy tuned in on that one signal now whenever the the Holy Spirit isn't sending a signal. What does the prophet do? Hangs out. I don't know. I mean, he doesn't really have anything to say for God because if he's a true prophet, he only is going to say when the signal comes. This is what I want to point out. This is very important when it comes to this gift of the Holy Spirit is the greatest gift. But don't ever try to make it happen when God's Spirit isn't sending the message. See, sometimes God's Spirit is sending a message to you. And you know it. And He's placed you. Now, this is the one thing that's really neat about the Lord, is that the Lord, I do not believe God is interested in buildings. He, that he needs buildings built for Him so that people can go to the building to hear His message. Because God says, i got a better plan. Paul wrote it. He said, do you not know that your bodies are temples for the what? The Holy Spirit. You're God's temple. And God wants to put His Spirit in each one of us. And the nice thing about that is these temples are portable. And they can be sent on assignment. So God's Spirit might just be put on Joanna. She might be feel God is telling her to tell someone something. And He can put her where she needs to be by the person who needs to hear that word. And so they can, God can bring His word through this gift of prophecy. Now, can women prophesy, by the way? In the Bible, do we have, do we have prophetesses? Yes, we do. Now, how many of you remember um, in the book of Luke when Jesus was brought to the temple to be dedicated? And it, time for him to get his, you know, the Jewish culture circumcised on the eighth day after the 40 days. He's brought up to the temple. And Simeon, the old guy, that... The Holy Spirit had told them, you're not going to die till you see the Messiah. As soon as they come, Mary and Joseph, in with Jesus. I love this part. They get in there, and, <laughs> and they, they walk in, and Simeon goes, you can take me now, Lord. I mean, that's literally what the guy says. My eyes have seen the salvation of Israel. Hey, everybody. He, just, I'll show you. Look at Luke chapter 2. I wanted to show you this real quick. He says, everybody, look at this. He says, in, um, this is verse 29 of Luke 2. He says, now, Lord, you are, you are, <coughs> sorry, 
<coughs> you are re releasing your bondservant to depart in peace. Okay, Lord. You finally said I can go. According to your word. He says, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all the peoples. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and his mother were amazed at the things that were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them. And, and he said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel, for a sign to be opposed. A sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that many thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And it says in the next verse, verse 36 of Luke chapter 2, And there was a prophetess named Anna, the daughter of Phanuel. She was from the tribe of Asher. And she was advanced in years. She had lived with her husband seven years after their marriage, and then as a widow to the age of 84. So she was only married. She, she, she married seven years, then widowed. And even then, it says, as a widow, she, she never left the temple, serving night and day with fastings and with prayers. Now, at the very moment she came up, and she began giving thanks to God. And she continued to speak of him to all who would, that were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Anybody looking for the Redeemer? Can you imagine? Here's this, this prophetess, Anna, in the temple. She's been serving there for years, this widow, in fastings and prayers. And as soon as the folks come in, anyone looking for the Redeemer? Guess what? Right here. And she began speaking of, of Jesus as a baby to everyone. Here's the Redeemer. Simeon's over there going, you can take me now, Lord. You fulfilled your word. My eyes have seen your redemption. He's so happy, you know, this baby is brought. He knows this day, this is the one. What a beautiful thing to, to get to, uh, to find out. He knows he's got the Messiah right there in front of him. Now, she's a prophetess, it says. Speaking of the things of God, this woman, this is, th in, the, in the Old Testament, there was a, a lady named Deborah. She was a, one, considered one of the greatest judges of Israel. She also was called a prophetess. Because she didn't just speak her own mind. She said, thus saith who? The Lord. So women are allowed to use the greatest gift there is. This is not a, this is not a, um, what you call, only for one sex, uh, I don't know what they, they got that, you know, gender. gender specific. This one is, this one God says, I, I let all my children use. It's the greatest one. But I told you last week, just like there was guidelines for how you, you use tongues, two or three at the most, in, in order, do it in an orderly manner. What about prophecy? What if we got together and someone said, hey, I have a word from the Lord. Should we let them say, share the word in the church? Well, let me show you some of the guidelines before we get break into doing this. Because, I, by the way, I wouldn't mind if God had a word for the church. Like, like well, he, did that, it, he did that through Agabus. I told, someone asked me where was that, by the way, when I got done with the sermon. It's in the book of Acts in two different places. My mind, I was having trouble remembering. Okay, we, it's um, near the end, like 21. And Paul, he takes his belt. He ties himself and says, whoever owns this belt, this is what awaits him in Jerusalem. That's Agabus, the prophet, did that. When, and, and Paul, you remember what Paul said in Acts 21? He's like, they're saying, Paul, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. You know, the Spirit is bearing witness. You're going to be beaten and bound. And Paul says, I don't care. You know, I, I'd gladly be beaten and bound for, for my faith. He, 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 even though the Spirit was testifying to this prophet. And that's the same guy who back earlier in the book of Acts, let me show you, in Acts chapter, let's see, what side of this, on this side of the page here. Um, where are you? Chapter 11, is it? When they're in Antioch. Hang on just a second. Someone finds it first. Tell me where it is. It's when uh, Paul, uh, 11, yeah, 11, uh, 20, Where is he?
Oh, yeah, here it is. You got it. Tw around 27, 28, it says, Now, this time there were some prophets that came down in verse 27 from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them's name was, verse 28, Agabus. And he stood up, and he began to indicate by the Spirit that there would be certainly a great famine over the whole world. And this took place, it says, in the reign of Claudius. And, and in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each one of them determined to send a contribution for relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in the charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. Now, I remembered the part about Barnabas and Saul, you know, being entreated with the gift that the people had gathered up and they sent it by the hand of Saul. They said, bring this over to Jerusalem. And so, because it's one of those few offerings. Paul never took up an offering for himself. But in this case, the Spirit of God, through this prophet Agabus, said, there's going to be a great famine. And it's going to hurt our brethren. It'd be like saying, maybe if God gave someone a word of prophecy that they're going to need some stuff over in Hilo side because of this volcano or something. And, and so I said, well, what should we do? You know, And the Spirit of God moved us to take up an offering and bring it over to them and help them out. And, or, or they're going to need a certain supplies or whatever. Then I, would, would we do that today like they did in the church back then? I mean, is that, does God still work like this, do you think? Sure. He's still the God that directs and, and guides and, and knows what's going to happen. This is the beauty of prophecy. Prophecy tunes us in to the, to the work of God. Now, in Corinth, they were so zealous about all the gifts. They're like, let's use them all, and let's use them all together. One guy's prophesying. One guy's speaking in tongues. A couple more popping up speaking in tongues. It, it, it became a circus spiritually that Paul got word that <laughs> it's like chaos over there. They're like freaking people out. You know, you walk in and there's people dancing around and, and speaking in tongues and other guys prophesy. You can't really pay attention to anything going on. You don't, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's confusion. Paul says, listen, when it comes to prophesying, verse 29, he says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others pass judgment. He says, and, and if the revelation is made, to another who's seated, then the first one must keep silent. Don't be interrupting someone who's already got the floor. Is what he's, that's how they put it, but that's how we would put it today. One guy is already prophesying. You don't just butt Skinsky in. Is that allowed to say that in church? You know, that, that, you I did. Sorry. He says in verse 31, you can all prophesy one by one. So that each one may learn and each all may be exhorted. All of us will be encouraged when you hear a word from the Lord. You know, he says, listen to this. This is very important. The spirit of the prophets are subject to those prophets. In other words, you can't say, but God's spirit took over me and I just couldn't help myself. I just blurted out in the middle while someone else was blurting out something God gave them. Do you think God interrupts himself? No. <laughs> He's not schizophrenic here. Listen, if you have a word from the Lord and you really feel like you have a word from the Lord and someone else is already sharing, wait. The word will still be there. If the word is not there, then you probably didn't get it from the Lord. Just saying. I mean, God is not a God of... Listen, he says it right here. For God is not... You might want to highlight verse 33. In case you run into some... How do we call them? Charismaniacs? Not charismatic. Spirit filled, but charismaniac. That's a term I learned from Pastor Chuck. He used to say, you know, there's a difference. God is, the, and this is the verse he would highlight, verse 33 of 1 Corinthians 14. God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. As is in all the churches of the saints. This is a rule, not just for the church at Corinth. What is for, for how many churches? All. All the churches should do things in an orderly manner that glorify God. So when people come, they go, wow, that was cool. I really got something. That, that was neat today. Now that, that one person got up and prophesied, or one person spoke in a tongue, and another one interpreted. What a beautiful thing that, that, that we heard the greatness of God. And, you know, it's, it's edifying. Now, that wasn't just the only two gifts that were working. He said in verse 26, when you assemble, each one of you has a psalm or a teaching or a revelation or a tongue or interpretation. Let all these things be done 
for edification, for building up one another. Now, we don't really practice church in this manner, how they did back then, where they got together and one person had a teaching, one person had a psalm, a song. You know, it's beautiful when someone, in my early Christian experience, I was up in, in, in Big Bear, uh, Lake Arrowhead area in San Bernardino Mountains. I went to Calvary's Bible School. I told you about that before. And we would get together and we were just seeking the Lord. And someone would say, hey, I got a song. The Lord gave me this song. And, and, and can I share it with you guys? Yeah, yeah, go. And so I was learning the guitar at the time, switching over from playing, growing up playing piano and accordion and clarinet. Couldn't really lead worship with a clarinet very good, so I was like, I need to figure out something else. And, and uh, <laughs> so they started singing, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. To worship you, O oh my soul, rejoice. And one of the guys goes, Take joy, my king, in what you see. And he just started singing. He was just making it up. And it actually became a song that, you know, I, I wrote some of the, the, the verses too for that. And when, when I first came to Hawaii, we flew into Calvary Chapel, Honolulu. And one of the verses that the Lord gave me for that same tune, with, you know, just another chorus to it was, uh, I love you, Lord, and I lift my hands to worship you. And, and I know some people change it. As my soul demands or commands, they switch around. I don't care. Take joy, my king. And I get there and they're singing some of the verses that the Lord gave me back when I was a young man in Bible school. The whole, I'd never heard it sung by, you know, a whole congregation to the Lord. I was like, wow, Lord, I'm really glad you called me on this assignment. Because, you know, I was just coming to Hawaii 26 years ago with my wife. And, and we land and we go to Calvary Chapel, Honolulu. And then I start to hear the song the Lord gave me as a young, young man. Just to one, of the, one of the courses I knew, whoever was leading worship had to, like back then, the only way we shared songs, we hand wrote out the lyrics and we scribbled in some chords above them and passed it. Around. We, you know, it wasn't real fancy. And I look in it and I'm like, oh, it's Dan. It's Dan Mantell, the guy that was, did worship leading at the Bible school. You know, he was one of the students too, but he was gifted in music too. And he could play multiple instruments and he taught me some of my first chords on the guitar and there he is leading. And I was like, I'm home. It's so neat how just one song. You know, one day the Lord told me when, when I got here, I had all the worship ready. And the Lord goes, that's great. Sing how great thou art. I mean, that's an oldie, Lord. Do it. First song. Okay, everybody. How many of you know the hymn, How Great Thou Art? <laughs> oh, Lord, my God. When I in awesome wonder, and I start singing it real slow and soft. There's an old man right over here, and he's sitting there checking me out, checking me out the whole song, just just intense stare. And I finished the hymn. He he kind of smiled like, "This place is okay." And then we did some contemporary praise songs, and he still continued to. Sing with it. He said, uh, and then he came up after during Aloha time and told me, well, I figure you must be okay if you lead with uh, How Great Thou Art. That's my favorite hymn. That's my grandmother's favorite hymn. That's why it's my favorite hymn, because it was her favorite hymn first. And then I get to here, and I was kind of wondering whether this is a cult or whether you guys are, you know, right with God. And the first song you sing is How Great Thou Art, so I figure you must be okay. Funny how a song... Just a song. One of you has a song, a psalm. Another one has a teaching. If we did church the way they did church, when they gathered together, they came together excited. How could God use each one of them? You know, some of you might have a word of, and maybe it's not to say to the whole church. Maybe it's just you have something on your heart to say to somebody else that you just feel impressed that you need to go up and encourage them. You know, let, maybe comfort them. Maybe you just, God is telling you, go over and hug that person. They need some comfort. Has anyone ever felt like that when you went to church, that God just told you, go over to that person, give them a hug, let them know that you're there if they need anything? And you thought, well, wh what's the big deal? That is a big deal if you're the person needing that that day. Very big deal. 
that we practice church in an orderly fashion that builds up everybody as we come together. Now, I know we don't do this this way, but, well, Paul had some more things to say about this. Do I have time? What time are we at? Is it, how much time have I gone? 30 minutes already? Time is... F okay, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sum up quickly the, ba the last part. In the last part, and this is really important, maybe... Yeah, okay, I, this is... I might come back to this next week for more elaboration, but just in case. When, the, when they came together as a congregation now, not, not, not afterwards, the afterglow or anything, just the, in the, in the por, part of the service where the Word of God will be read. In the Jewish culture, they would give... This is the time of reading of the Scripture. Very important. During this time, listen... Women, it said, were to keep silent in the church. Now, this is one of the ones, I'm going to ask you a question that, um, how, many, have, how many of you know couples where you know that the women is a little bit spiritually ahead of the guy in his growth? You know, like more, been in the Lord longer, more mature, um, has more years in the Lord, and the guy is lagging. Okay, it... it I hate to say this, but it's a very common thing. It happens in our culture. That w women are sensitive to the spirit. Some men are not. But it can be true of women, too. I'm not saying that only. I just have, a, it, it's a generalization. Ge generally, women are more sensitive to the leading of the spirit. They, they have a more tuned-in ear. So it's interesting. He says, women, here's some guidelines for the women. When you come into the part of the service like this, the women have to remain silent. You say, but, but that's not fair. L let, let me tell you what he says. And I, I'm going to propose this from a different angle. Maybe you might, um, well, how many of you heard me say that women, Paul said, uh, women, he quotes from Genesis, it's not good for man to be alone, so God will make a helpmate suitable for him. How many of you remember what that means uh, indicating about the men? What do they need? Help. Help. Right. <laughs> help. <laughs> See, by God's design, God said, these guys need help. I'm going to make women to help them. <laughs> they need help. Now, see, guys, most guys are like, don't mention that pastor because I, that makes us sound weak. <laughs> no, it just means we need help. Okay? And God uses women to help us men in a lot of ways what we really need help in. Like my wife is way more sensitive to people's feelings than I am. You're doing something wrong, I'm going to tell you. I'll call you on the carpet. You stupid, what are you doing? Knock it off. Don't you know that's going to hurt you? And she'll be like, did you ever consider how it makes them feel the way you talk to them? <laughs> no. <laughs> Who cares? They're doing something stupid. Using a chop saw without the guard and sticking their hand in there. They're going to chop off a... A, a digit, you know. Like, but honey, you can say it in a nicer way. I'm Ray Sicilian. We don't do that. We just tell you, hey, dummy, use a push stick or hold it, you know. Don't, you don't use a table saw that way. You don't use... But see, I need a little help in <coughs> fixing those rough edges. So God gives me this beautiful helper. But let me submit something to you. If she was to give me that suggestion in front of the person I just told, how would I feel? Not very good. And by the way, you'll never see my wife do that. She has tact. More tact than I have. She knows don't ever do that in front of the people. She waits till later. When we're alone and it's not going to make, um, you know, embarrassment or awkwardness. She knows how to do it the right way. Now, here, women, some women get really mad when I read this passage. I, I'm going to submit this to you a different way. I see this through a whole different lens. L if you can just listen, let me show you something about this that I think women could pull off one of the best things they could possibly do for helping their, their husbands. If they would just follow this, and just know, if you think it through to the end, you'll see why. You, you'll get it. Watch this. He says, women are not permitted to, pe to speak in church. 
They are, they are subject themselves, just as the law says. Remember, Christ is the head of the church. The man is the head of the bride, you know, of his wife. Each part is subject to the, it's just an order of subjection, he said. Now, if they desire to learn anything, Paul says, let them ask their own husbands at home. For it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Was it, was it from you that the word of God first went forth, or has it come to you only? Now, if anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, Paul says, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. But if anyone does not recognize this, Paul says, he's not recognized. He said, this isn't optional, like this women speaking in church thing. Like, he says, look, this is a command from the Lord. Paul doesn't pull this command from the Lord stuff very often. You notice that in his writings? He's always very encouraging, very uplifting. He never pulls one of those, hey, guys, the Lord commands this. So this is kind of a big deal. And this gets some people really mad. Not me, though, because I look at it and go, he says something very important. If the woman has a question, let her ask who? Her husband. This is, by the way, for you married gals, the protocol that God requires for you to find out an, a spiritual answer to a spiritual question. Even if you're ahead of your husband, you say, but, but he's way behind me. I'm way farther ahead in the Lord than he is. I got a question for you. How do you know that it's not God's way of making him catch up? How do you know that your question is not going to, when you go home and ask him, honey, I don't understand. The pastor was talking about this. And I don't get it. Could you explain it to me? And he was like daydreaming during that part. He didn't even remember that part. She, and she says, could you, could you um, find, you know, honey, you're, I respect you. You'll figure out the answer for me. Now, what's he do? Scrambles. Oh, no, I better call the pastor. Pastor, hey, excuse me, I got a question. Now, is he allowed to call the pastor and ask a question? Sure. And you think, well, what good is all this question asking? I got a question for you. How many of you have noticed that when you go to lectures or you, you take a, a college course and you walk in and the very first thing the teacher does is write on the, on the blackboard a big question? Why does this work this way? Why do teachers lead in with questions? Are questions actually a, 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 a viable teaching tool? Of course. So one of the most powerful ways to teach is to use inductive teaching. It's called using a question to make the gray matter engage. And you gals don't realize the power you have to ask the question to your husband to now make him have to engage and now he's got to think about the answer, and he might not know the answer. So now he's got to go ask someone else the answer. And how do you know that God doesn't want to use that very question to stimulate his growth? All in his attempt to help answer your question. See, some of the ladies that are ahead of their husbands are, are a little bit full of pride about it. I'm so far ahead of him, he could never tell me stuff. Well, you just got too proud. I'm sorry, gals. Because God put your husband as your head. And if you leave him as your head, maybe God will help him get ahead. And maybe he even used the very questions you ask as the stimulus to his growth. Maybe God designed it that way so that some men who are lagging get to catch up with the rest of the group. You know, you might be placed in that precarious position, but you need to learn how to use that position in a way that honors God. And the way you honor God in that is you don't ask the question, oh, pastor, my husband's an idiot. He won't know the answer to this. Let me ask you in front of everybody. By the way, I've had people do that in church. And you, I've actually answered, excuse me, aren't you married? They're like, yes. Well, I'm sorry, but the scripture says you need to ask your husband at home. Let him teach you. What? You're not going to answer my question. This church is no good. I'm out of here. <laughs> I'd say, don't let the door hit you, but we don't have a door. But go ahead. <laughs> you know that saying, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm going to stick to the scripture. There's a reason that this is taught this way. And it wasn't a suggestion. He said, this is the Lord's command. 
The Lord commanded this, and it wasn't one of those culturally sensitive things. It was one of those for the whole of the church things, so that we would grow together. Isn't the whole idea of the gifts of the Spirit to help us all grow and, and practice the gifts in an orderly way so we all grow as a church together? And if one of the rules in the whole practicing of the gift is, you know, okay, two or three at most, in order, not interrupting each other, with an interpreter, or when you do the, ju the, the prophesying, two, three, but each in order, and let them judge the prophecy. Remember, it did say to judge whether this be the Lord. You know, I didn't even cover that part, I'm sorry, but, but in, in summing up, we would say, does anyone agree that was a word from the Lord? Or is that person just making up something? Because some people just like to stand up just to say something so everyone gets to hear their voice. That doesn't mean it's the Lord. Or just because they let in with, well, thus saith the Lord. God wants Sally to marry me. There was a guy who actually did this at a church because he wanted the girl to marry him. <laughs> Thankfully, I was there with the pastor who had a little bit more, um, you know, he, Moxie. He said, uh, excuse me, son, that is not a word from the Lord. That's your, that's your flesh wanting her to marry you. Don't be hiding it under, couching it in some kind of spiritual sounding, you know, that's what he was doing. I got a word from the Lord. Sally Joe is supposed to marry me. You know, uh, uh, Pastor like, wrong. And I'm pretty sure her dad wouldn't agree. Let's pass judgment on this, you know. <laughs> they judged it right away. Not the Lord. Now, if anyone, Paul says, is spiritual, Anyone here feel like you're, you're walking in God's spirit? He says, then look at verse 37. If you think yourself to be spiritual, then recognize that these things I write to you are the Lord's commandment. This is not a Just If you're in the spirit, you know this is from the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, Paul says, he is not recognized. They say, I don't want to go with this. I'm Okay. Then we don't recognize you either. Sorry. And therefore, he says, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy. Don't forbid to speak in tongues, but all things must be done in a proper and orderly manner. When you do the things of the Spirit, they don't make confusion. They make building up. People get built up. They're like, wow, that was so cool. I mean, I love when God uses his power in our midst to speak to people, to build people up, to, to give them maybe a gift of healing. Can, can, can gifts of healings or miracles take place in a service? Sure. I'm like, I don't know about you. I know some people are like, don't do that at our church. You do that at the other church, not here. I'm like, poor God. It's like he has to like work on just like little eek out here, a little over there. A little. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a church where we said, we'll take whatever you give. Well, I mean, whatever you want to give to us, we, could, we, we would like to be the vessels for that move of your spirit would anyone be willing to do that with me if god said i i got some hurting people you know they they came during the breakfast this morning and i'm gonna need a few of you to to come early next week and pray over them and you know what if god's spirit spoke that just like a word of encouragement exhortation for our body so some of you come early next week and you're standing around and god goes that's the one right over there go over and pray for that fellow or that gal that her clothes are torn and she you know has no shoes and God tells you, go over there and give her your shoes. Would we be operating as a church if we did that? In the spirit, I'm talking about, you know, in his, yes. And that's what I think God desires. I mean, we're, we're in a culture that just kind of has boxed God into a box that he's not really getting to move through the containers that he desires. And we are the containers. Do you not know? How many of you know that your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit? You are God's portable container. And some of you are going to be sent on assignment this week. This is where I do the prophes prophetic part. I have that gift too. And I love that part because there are some of you going to be sent this week. I'm just prophesying from the Lord that you're going to be sent to bring comfort to some of those people on the other side of our island. They're losing everything right now. Their houses are burning up. The lava is heading toward their, to, to their land right now. They're going to lose the land that they grew up on. And they're going to be hurting. 
And you might just be the one God puts the words of comfort in your mouth. Or maybe he's going to tell you, give them your shoes, your clothes. Because they lost it all and it was burnt up. And you're going to be their side. And you don't even know this yet. But if God should do that, who would be willing to be used? See, I like this group. I wish I had the camera to pan around. All the hands going up. Will be used. Use us, Lord, as you see fit. That's our... That's my past as a pastor of this fellowship that's my heart is that we would all let God's spirit use us to build a, build up the whole body and there's going to be some hurting ones this week guys there is it, it, some of you are called to intercede that means to pray on their behalf and you're not going to even sleep well this week because you're going to keep waking up praying for them but that's good do it just dig in and pray because they need your prayers Prayer is also invisible, like gravity. But is it powerful? It can move mountains, guys. It can do powerful things. Don't downplay these things of the Spirit that you can't see with the physical eyes, but with the eyes of the Spirit, with the ear of the Spirit. I can just end like Jesus always did. Let those that have an ear to hear what I'm saying today, may you hear what the Spirit of God is speaking to you. So you can be a vessel. Let's close. Father, I pray that your spirit would fill each of us to a, a greater filling, Lord, an overflowing portion of your spirit that we would be vessels that would be just conduits for your spirit's work to our community. Lord, to the people you place around us, that they would feel that touch of your spirit just pouring forth through us. Lord, whether it be a, a gesture of, of kindness or a, a kind word spoken a simple offering of love, of a gift, or something to help bless somebody's day, Lord. Just let us be able to hear what your Spirit would want to speak to us, that we might be able to pass on your touch to, to those around us, Lord, the ones you put in our lives. And I ask you to do that, Lord, that all of our body would be edified and built up. In the name of your Son, Jesus, I ask these things. And everyone that agreed with me said, Amen. Amen. Would you Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.